A few years ago, I used to drive back and forth from Lakewood to Brooklyn for about 16 years to the Sephardic community where Baruch Hashem, Hashem blessed me with a wonderful shul and a school. And we used to go back and forth from Lakewood. I would go every day and my wife and kids would come in every Shabbat. One Friday afternoon, the minivan was all packed up and ready to leave to Brooklyn. And suddenly I get a call. <laughs> Reb David! Nobody calls me Reb David. <laughs> Rabbi David, I don't know where that came from. But Reb David, nobody calls me Reb David. I said, yeah, who, who's this? He says, this is Harav so-and-so. I said, oh, I remembered. I know the name. Don't know him. But he's a Roshiva of, of Yeshiva. I said, Harav, uh, you know, was macht der Roshiva? Uh, how can I help? Uh, I try to use every Yiddish word I knew. <laughs> you know, what do I owe the honor to this call? Reb David, listen. There's a Bacher that's been out on the streets for three years. He's been to therapists and psychiatrists and even Askanim. Reb David, he hasn't kept Shabbos in three years. You think you can meet him for a few minutes? If I send him over to your house in 15 minutes, you think you can sit and talk with him? I said, Roshiva, listen, I, uh, I, I don't know what you've heard to make this call. I'm not exactly uh, what I think you think. <laughs> but I'm really based in Brooklyn. I, I, I officially live in Lakewood, but I'm in Brooklyn seven days a week. You need somebody here in Lakewood that really works with these guys that could help him because this is a round-the-clock job and it takes a lot of follow-up and a tremendous amount of love. And if you're not there to deliver it, it's not going to work. Reb David, nonetheless, please, it's a mace mitzvah. I, I have nobody else. I, I tried everybody. Please. No matter what I said, he would not take no for an answer. Till suddenly I realized, I said to myself, Roshiva, let me just ask a question. Is it possible that this boy is related to you? There's silence on the phone. And then his voice cracks. He says, yeah, this is my son. I said, oh, if that's the case. Kirachem aval banim. I can't say no to you. Send them over. What are you going to tell? I don't know what I'm going to tell them. I don't have a clue. <laughs> MS, I don't. But the Abishtu will put the words in my, I don't know. Send them over. Fifteen minutes later, there's a knock on my front door. I ran outside to the minivan. Hazita, my wife, is sitting there ready to leave to Brooklyn after she packed up the entire minivan with suitcases and she's done this back and forth for 16 years. It's only because of her. Hashem should bless her. I went into the car. I said, uh, honey, uh, I think everyone should come back inside. We're not going anywhere yet. She says, why? I said, I, I got a call that I have to uh, take care of a boy. She says, all right. She knows she married a nutcase. It's, <laughs> it was part of the ketubah. <laughs> we come back inside. And as I said, 15 minutes later, there's a knock on the door. And I open the door. And there's standing a kid, about 16 years old. And he has his sheepish little smile. And he's wearing a heavy metal t-shirt with jeans ripped by the knees. And he has a little bit of a hair thingy going on on his shoulders. And he has a bandana right across his forehead. I like the 70s look a little bit. And I said, hey, how are you? And he looks at me and he's looking at me up and down like this. And he says, are you the rabbi that I'm supposed to be meeting? I said, yo, bro. <laughs> Who are you calling rabbi? You got to go easy with those words. You know, we, we, you know we're just... Going to just hang and chill for a few minutes. It's not like that. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah, come on in. We come in. We sit down on the couch together. I grab him a drink. We start talking back and forth. And he says to me, so you're going to start telling me about God and about Shabbos and about tzitzis? I said, no. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I think you're a great kid. I 
just want to chill with you a few minutes and let's just talk about, you know, the world. And he says, okay. And we're talking. Till finally in the mid-conversation I said, tell me, what are you passionate about? Well, what do you love to do? Where's your heart? What makes you tick? And he says to me, I play the saxophone. I said, get out, no way. You play the saxophone, really? He says, yeah. I said, I'm looking you over, I think you're good. He says, I am good. I said, really, wow, okay. Listen to me, kid. You're gonna pick yourself up right now. You're gonna walk right out that door. You're gonna go, you're gonna get your saxophone, and you're gonna come back here to this house, and you're gonna play me something. His jaw dropped. He said, what? I said, you heard me. Go get the saxophone. You got 15 minutes to be back here. I'm dying to hear you play. I think I'm looking at a star. I just got to hear it for myself. Kid looked at me like he couldn't believe his ears. He shrugs his shoulders. He says, okay. He walks right out the door. Now, ladies, listen up well. I want to be very open and honest with you. You know, these days I hear people are out there giving courses on Kiruv. I didn't know Kiruv is something you can teach. Kiruv is something that everyone possesses. It all depends on one thing. Either you love him or you don't. That's it. I gave you the whole course in one sentence. And they'll tell you everything they'll tell you. And that's great. But the truth... Either you love him or you don't. Either you have it or you don't. Because in the cure of courses, they tell you, the minute you get your hand on that kid, don't ever let him go. I heard this from a bunch of guys. Don't ever let him go. Because chances are you'll never get another shot at him. I hear. So I guess I just broke the first rule. And because of that, I was sitting there on the couch with my Tehillim, and I started praying. I said, Borei Olam, please, I threw you the ball. Throw it back. Minashamayim. Fifteen minutes later, there's a knock on the door. I go to the door. I open the door. And there he is, the sheepish kid, the same heavy metal T-shirt and same ripped jeans. But this time, he has this uh, funky little hat backwards. <laughs> and he's holding this saxophone like a mother holds a newborn baby. And he was gripping it like this is my life. And I looked at him and I said, wow, look at that. Look how, it, look, look, that sh look how that shines. It's gorgeous. And it looks good on you. Come in here. Let me hear your music. And the kid comes walking in like he was six feet tall. I turned to my wife and I said, okay, honey, listen. Uh, we're going downstairs to the basement. No matter what you hear, don't call the cops. <laughs> it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. And she looked at me like, I said, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> so me and the saxophonist, we go down to the basement. We close the door. He starts tuning up. I said, this kid can really play. I said, okay, I want to hear your best, buddy. Let me hear something good. And he looks at me and he says, no, Rabbi, I want a song from you. I want to play you a song. You'll play me a song. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, give me a minute. Let me think. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, okay, you'll play, uh, play Mordechai Ben David, Let My People Go. There's a great saxophone on that. He looks at me, Mordechai who? I said, uh-huh. Uh, so you don't know Jewish, mu Jewish music? Rabbi. Get real, are you serious? I said, oh. I said, well, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, I, I don't really know English music much. So I guess you're just going to have to play something. He says, no. I want to play you a song. You got to know some song. I said, I don't know any English music. And I'm racking my brain. And he starts saying, do you know this? Do you know that? And I said, no, I never heard of it. At least up here on tape, I will not admit to it. I have kids to marry, you know. <laughs> so finally I'm racking my brains and I thought to myself and I said, whoa, I got it. I remember, I remember 10, maybe 12 years ago when I was coming home, one time 
from the city, and I was in high school, there was a big Abid, a big black guy that got on the train, and he had this really cool gig where instead of just going and asking people for money, he sang. So he says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to sing to you a song, and then I'll come around for your contributions. I said, oh, that's, this is going to be interesting. There's nothing more interesting than a train ride from the city to Brooklyn. So this guy gets up and he starts singing this song, and it was really catchy. As a matter of fact, he got everybody in the car into it, and everyone started clapping together with him. And he was, and I, and I said, I remember the chorus because it was kind of easy. It was the same words over and over again. And I said it was something like, um, lean on me. Don't sing it. <laughs> and he looks at me, the kid, and he says, wow, Rabbi, that's a great pick. That's a great song. And there's a great sax on it. I said, okay, great. Let's do it. So the kid starts playing the song. And he's getting into it. And then after 30 seconds, he stops. And he says, wait one second. You're not singing. I said, me? <laughs> I, I, uh, I speak for a living. I don't, I don't sing. He says, no, come on, Rabbi, you got to sing. I'm playing, you sing. I said, are you serious? He says, yeah. I said, oh, Lord, if my wife hears this, this is the end of it. I said, you sh he says, yeah. I said, okay, I only know the chorus. I only know the high part. He says, go ahead, start singing. I said, okay. So he starts playing, and I'm singing, lean on me. And he's playing, and I'm singing, and he's playing, and he's getting into it, and he's getting into it, and this kid is working up a sweat. And he was amazing, by the way. He was so good and so taken that literally he went back on his back on the back of a little Tyke's kitchen set and he's kicking his feet in the air like he's in Carnegie Hall and he's playing that saxophone like literally Lincoln Center, here we come. And I'm singing Lean On Me to imagine that at the end of the day. And then we stop. He stands up. And he puts down the saxophone. And he walks up to me. And he gives me such a hug. I'll never forget that hug. And he didn't say one word to me. And I didn't say one word to him. And quietly, we both walked upstairs. He walked out the front door. I went out into the car. And my wife took one look at me. And she said, seriously? <laughs> what are you going to do next, Superman? <laughs> and we pulled out of the driveway, and we were on our way to Brooklyn, and I, I thought that was it. We got to Brooklyn, we went through the same ordeal. Half an hour before Shabbat began, my phone rang. I picked it up. Reb David! I said, uh-oh. Reb David, what did you say to my son? I said, uh, you really want to know? <laughs> Reb David, did you speak to my son about Shabbos? No. <laughs> did you speak to my son about the Rebbeinu Shalaylam? No. He spoke to my son about tefillin, mitzvahs. No. So what did you say to my son? I said, lean on me. <laughs> Reb David, I don't understand what that means. I don't know what you're talking about. But Reb David, listen to me. I don't know what you said. But I just want to tell you something. A half an hour ago, there was a knock at the door. And my wife was in the kitchen preparing for Shabbos. And the Roshiva said that he ran to the front door and he opened the door. And then the Roshiva says, my son was standing at my door for the first time in three years. He says, my son looked up at me and he said, Abba, it's been three years. I think it's long enough. I haven't kept Shabbos once in three years. I want to come home to Shabbos. I want to spend Shabbos with you. Reb David, what did you say to my son? 
You talk to him about the Rebina Shalalem? No, not yet. He spoke to him about Shabbos? No, not yet. What did you say? I spoke to him about his saxophone. Because the secret, ladies, is to connect first and then preach. But it has to be with unconditional love. When we have that unconditional love, when we have that feeling for somebody, our kids won't need anybody else. Our spouses will laugh at social media. Such a cheap, strange, outside, quick, will never go up against the home of a Jew. Ladies, before we talk about rebuilding the bayit of the Bet HaMikdash, let's rebuild the bayit of the Jewish home.